So in honor of Women's History Month, I'm going to introduce you to some African-American women whose lives and work have helped shape California history. We're going to start with the 19th century uh, and women who arrived in California for the most part during the gold rush. Their bravery personifies the quote from one of the women we'll meet today who said uh, when she was talking about the risks she'd taken in her life, I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. This is a photograph of Nancy and Peter Gooch on their wedding day in Coloma in El Dorado County, California in 1857. Now you may remember from fourth grade in uh, your California elementary school that uh, Coloma is where gold was discovered just a few years before Nancy and Peter Gooch were married by James Marshall on the American River uh, running through Sutter's Mill. Nancy and Peter arrived in California as enslaved people. Their baby son, Andrew, had been sold to another slaveholder before they made the journey from Missouri to California with a slaveholder, William Gooch. Nancy and Peter bought their freedom in 1850 in California and began farming and buying land in Coloma. After many years of searching and after Peter died, Nancy was reunited with her son. He was a grown man now, Andrew Monroe, his wife, Sarah, and their children. The family together with Andrew there amassed over the years more than 600 acres in, in El Dorado County with fruit orchards, vegetable and flower gardens and groves of fir trees. What you're seeing is a picture of a house on the left built by Pearlie Monroe, who was Andrew's eldest son and Nancy's eldest grandchild. And it's next to a blacksmith shop, which was also built by Pearlie Monroe. And both of them are still standing in Coloma as part of Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park. In the 1940s, the state of California purchased hundreds of acres of the Monroe family property. And the Monroe family property included the site of Sutter's Mill, the uh, location of that historic discovery. And the state used the property to build uh, the historic park. Nancy Gooch, is buried in Pioneer Cemetery in Coloma, and you can visit many of these uh, landmarks. Mary Ellen Pleasant is the source of our quote for this section. Toward the end of her life, she wrote, my cause was the cause of freedom and equality for myself and for my people, and I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. Mary Ellen Pleasant was one of the wealthiest women in San Francisco. She brought a fortune with her when she arrived in San Francisco in 1852 from uh, Massachusetts with her husband and daughter. She invested in gold mines and real estate. She operated boarding houses, laundries and restaurants. And this is a picture of one of her mansions in San Francisco before it was torn down in 1927. She used her wealth in the battle for freedom. She gave to anti-slavery causes, including helping John Brown finance his raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. And a lot of people also are surprised to find out that uh, because California was admitted to the Union as a free state in 1850, that slavery was practiced in the state. And Mary Ellen Pleasant was one of the people who helped hide fugitives, helped finance lawsuits against slavery uh, and other uh, uh, activities. This is a picture of an omnibus railroad company streetcar in the 1860s. 
Mary Ellen Pleasant was also among several African American citizens of San Francisco who sued streetcar companies for racial discrimination. And what happened in these cases was either the conductors refused to stop and pick up black passengers or once they discovered black passengers, the conductors threw them off the trains. And there were several people if you, if in the lawsuits that I read uh, who suffered very serious injuries because of this. Mary Ellen Pleasant won her lawsuits in court and there were others as I mentioned um, like Charlotte Brown who sued and won. But it wasn't until 1890 and California uh, legislature passed its first Civil Rights Act, the Dibble Act, that it would become illegal to discriminate based on race in public ac accommodations in the state. In Los Angeles, a landmark court case freed Biddy Mason and her family in 1856. Biddy Mason and her family had trekked with their Mormon slaveholders, Robert and Rebecca Smith from Mississippi to Southern California. And when they arrived, Smith kept his captives trapped in the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, there are even um, the Santa Monica Mountains as part of a national park system. And there are even park rangers now that give tours and tell stories about the experiences of Biddy Mason and her family when they were held captive um, in the uh, 1850s. But what Biddy and Hannah, who was another woman among the enslaved uh, with her family, they had in their time in Southern California met free black people in Los Angeles and in San Bernardino who let them know that California was a free state and it might be possible if they took action to win their freedom. One of those people, Robert Owen, who's a fascinating character himself, a wealthy African-American man who owned a livery stable and a lumber business in downtown Los Angeles. Robert Owen got the Los Angeles County Sheriff to bring a writ of habeas corpus and Owen and 10 of the vaqueros who worked for him in his stable rode on horseback with the sheriff into the mountains and rescued Biddy, Hannah, and their families. In the ensuing court case, Biddy couldn't testify because at this time, California had a state law prohibiting African-Americans from testifying in court. The judge, Benjamin Hayes, met with Biddy in chambers, and at the end of the trial, after speaking with her, he declared that according to his interpretation of California's constitution, Biddy and her family were forever free. This is a picture of the Biddy Mason homestead in downtown Los Angeles in the 1860s or early 1870s. She worked as a nurse and a midwife and with the help of Robert Owen began buying real estate. She was one of the early people to invest in the future of Los Angeles. At the time she arrived, Los Angeles was a rough city of no more than between 1,500 and 2,000 people. She became one of the wealthiest women west of the Mississippi. She was well known among all racial groups and throughout the community as a philanthropist, a nurse, a founder of First African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was so well known that when she died, she was eulogized in the Los Angeles Times. Fame, the church that she helped build on land that she owned is still around and flourishing. And the Biddy Mason Memorial Park is on the site of her former homestead on Spring Street downtown between 4th and 5th Street. Now we're gonna move south to San Diego County where America Newton, a former enslaved woman from Independence, Missouri arrived in um, Julian in San Diego County in 1872. 
she acquired 80 acres of land to homestead and she acquired a horse and a buggy that you could see her seated off here to help her with travel. And she ran a laundry business. So the horse and buggy helped her carry items to and from her customers. She was a well-known figure in Julian. And as a washerwoman, she performed a vital function in gold country. Through her occupation, Newton was able to live an independent life and help develop the town of Julian. We'll enter the 20th century with a look at a sample of women's clubs from around the state. And we're going to borrow from the motto, uh, deeds, not words. This is a picture of the women of the California State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. The picture was taken in 1915 and they are seated on in front of a building. This is during an annual meeting in Oakland, California. The women came from clubs from all over the state and the Federation was founded in 1906. These clubs throughout California were busy in philanthropic efforts in a time when white institutions would not serve African-Americans Black women's clubs build daycare centers, old folks homes, and other institutions to serve their communities. Deeds, not words, was their motto. This is a phrase that was borrowed from suffragist Alice Paul, who founded the National Women's Party, and it demonstrated the Black women's feminism and their practicality. Another club, the League of Allied Arts, was founded in Los Angeles by educator Dorothy Vina, who is on the left, and um, social worker Juanita Miller. Dorothy was married to lawyer Ivan Hughes Johnson III. Her father, James Vina, was a well-known civic figure and a founder of the Los Angeles NAACP in 1914. Juanita was married to civil rights attorney and judge Lauren Miller. And the two of them began the League of Allied Arts in 1939 to support African-American artists when their friend, the poet Langston Hughes was unable to find a white theater in Los Angeles that would agree to let them stage one of Hughes's plays. The League still is operating and their primary work is as philanthropists, they provide financial assistance to young African-American artists. They've been doing this for decades from painter jo Jacob Lawrence in the 1940s to ballerina Misty Copeland when she was a student in Long Beach uh, before becoming the first black principal dancer in the American Ballet Theater. And moving to northward to Sacramento for a moment, the Women's Civic Improvement Club of, uh, and looking at the Women's Civic Improvement Club of Sacramento, which has been providing programs, services, and activities to support a low-income communities really since 1924, because it was then that a few dedicated African-American women decided to uh, confront the desperate need for housing for minority women in the city of Sacramento. At that time, as people were coming into uh, the state of California, there was a, a boom after World War I, during World War I and after World War I. Um, because of racial segregation, uh, housing opportunities for minority women were confined to the local red light district. So these women in Sacramento began to provide housing in the form of dormitories in the beginning and employment assistance to African-American and other minority women. The club still is operating in Sacramento and they, one of the programs that they run is the, uh, 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 the oldest uh, operating Head Start uh, program in the city. Now we're gonna take a look 
at uh, uh, teachers, uh, I think of teachers as the backbone of the community. And um, the motto for this group uh, comes from uh, a statement that was made by one of the teachers we'll meet, I have kept the faith. What we're looking at here are pictures of some of California's earliest African-American teachers. Uh, they were educators when the law in California in the 19th century prohibited black students from attending whites only schools. So on the left, uh, Elizabeth Thorne Scott Flood, she started schools for colored children in Sacramento and Oakland and on the right is um, Mary Sanderson, who's the tall person in the group of, of, of people with her students there. She was a daughter. She was a second generation educator. This photograph was taken in 1870. Her father, Reverend Jeremiah B. Sanderson, uh, came to California during the gold rush and brought his family and um, she's shown with pupils of the colored school in Oakland in 1870. Bessie Brewington's parents came from Kansas to Los Angeles by covered wagon in 1877, and they settled in North Hollywood where Bessie was born. Uh, she graduated from Los Angeles Polytechnic High School and she attended what became UCLA. Back then it was known as the Los Angeles State Normal School. And out of a class of 800, she graduated number seven. Her first teaching assignment was at Holmes Avenue School. And you see in the group portrait, she's standing on the, on the left there. And she, be, she was promoted to principal at Holmes Avenue Elementary School in 1918, becoming the first African-American principal in the Los Angeles school system. Throughout her life, she served with a number of civic organizations, including the YWCA, the Native California Club, the Wilfendel Club, the Delta Sorority, and the NAACP. <clears throat> When she retired in 1955, she had been in the Los Angeles Unified School District for 44 years. And our final example of a, a pioneering teacher, um, you heard me say that Bessie Brewington became the first black principal in Los Angeles in 1918. This is Blossom Lorraine Golson, and she became the first African-American teacher in the San Diego schools in 1942. It took until World War II before the color line was broken on the teaching staff in the public schools in San Diego. The district was forced to open up hiring because of the war. There were new students, the schools were becoming crowded, and there was a shortage of male teachers due to the war. She was said to be the model candidate. She was a native Californian with degrees from San Diego City College and the Ivy League Columbia University. She died at, um, in 2015. She was 102 years old. Her obituary led with a Bible verse from 2 Timothy. And that's where we get the motto from this sect for this section which says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, looking at the early 20th century and some women in politics, our quote comes from Betty Hill. It's something she said in 1947. She said, the world is in need of aggressive leadership and aggressive leadership must come from the women. We'll meet Betty Hill and learn more about her in a moment. In the meantime, we're going to start with Faye Allen. I'm still doing research on Faye Allen. Um, she was a figure who was buried in history. 
And it only came out recently that they, Allen was the first African-American elected on, to the Los Angeles Board of Education. She won her uh, campaign in 1939. I've been reading through Los Angeles Unified School District records to learn more about her. And one of the things that she was responsible for was renaming McKinley School to what is now George Washington Carver Middle School, named after the famous African-American scientist who taught at Tuskegee Institute. And she also was responsible for raising issues and bringing in experts and speakers to board meetings um, on the need for African-American teachers and counselors in the nearly all white faculty and staff of the district at that time. Betty Hill was a founder of the Los Angeles NAACP in 1914. One of the things that she accomplished was she led a multi-year legal battle against the city of LA's segregated public swimming pools. A lot of people don't know that in 1926, the Playground Commission of the City of Los Angeles officially segregated recreation centers and swimming pools. Black children were only allowed to use public swimming pools one afternoon of the week. Because of her leadership, that changed in 1931. And it's a marvelous, very dramatic story of that protracted struggle, the community organizing that took place. In 1940, uh, Betty Hill, at continuing in her life of politics, became the first Black female delegate from west of the Mississippi at the Republican National Convention. All her life, she fought racism and misogyny and championed civil rights. She founded an organization called the Women's Political Study Club, which had a great deal of clout. When she died, her obituary in the Los Angeles Sentinel read, no history of political life in California can be written without a chapter or two devoted to her. And her former home on 37th Street is a historic monument. One of our um, political activists is Mary Frances Mary Albrier. Now she moved to Berkeley, California from Alabama in 1920, where she began nearly six decades of community activism while working as a nurse, a maid and a union organizer. And she, uh, among other things, she ran for the Berkeley City Council in 1939, um, the efforts to break the color line on the Berkeley City Council weren't successful though until 1959 when a black candidate made it onto the council. She applied during World War II for a job as a welder in the shipyards at the Kaiser shipyards in Richmond and she was turned down. So she fought and she won and became the first black woman welder in the um, Richmond shipyards during World War II. And her victory paved the way for thousands of women workers to secure better paying jobs in the Bay Area's booming shipyard industry. If it wasn't for people like Frances Mary Albrier, we wouldn't be talking about Rosie the Riveters uh, being a diverse group of women. Uh, Albrier would go on to integrate Berkeley's League of Women Voters and the Red Cross. She was a prominent member of the National Council of Negro Women. In her later life, she became a peace and disarmament activist and a pioneer for fighting for the rights of senior citizens and people with disabilities. We're gonna end with one of my favorites, who is Charlotta Bass. Now we all know that California is home to the first black woman and South Asian woman to become vice president of the United States. 
Kamala Harris. But many people don't know that California is also home to the first African-American woman to run for the office of vice president. Charlotta Bass was the vice presidential candidate on the Progressive Party ticket with Vincent Hallinan in 1952. She was also the crusading publisher of the largest African-American owned newspaper in the Western United States. The California Eagle was established in 1879 and she began running it in the early 20th century and was the publisher for 40 years. This picture was taken outside the office of the California Eagle on Central Avenue in Los Angeles. Well, this has been just a small sampling of some of the Black women leaders who have helped shape California. And I wanna thank you for sharing their histories with me. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I love seeing all of these photos. It really brings these stories of these real people who had such an impact to life when we get to see them, you know, in front of their homes or their portraits for, you know, LAUSD and their districts. So I thank you for the time that you have taken to, to research and to steep in, in this history and really pull out a lot of what is missing from top line history that is taught to us all uh, in education or what we are exposed to. And I kept hearing every story was a female who took a risk, who was brave. They were all so savvy. So many entrepreneurs rising from very little to becoming very wealthy and not just financially wealthy, but expending what their experience is to, to all the people. And I love all of these clubs that are created that it really was to promote feminism and education philanthropy, just the care of others. So I love that you, you named this deeds, not words, because they all really did lead by example. So lots of praise for you in this presentation in the chat. So I want to um, extend some of that to you as well. And I love the, the comment from your colleague, Ms. Iver over at CAM that your research could really be expanded and used in the LA school system that, you know, we shouldn't have to come to a lifelong learning women's forum to be exposed to such important information. So at this time, is there anyone within our group that has a question that they would like to pose to Ms. Anderson? I tried to wait ladies, I waited <laughs> as long as I could. <laughs> Um, Mary Ellen Pleasant from San Francisco, is there, do you know, is there a relationship, a connection with um, the Mary Ellen Pleasant that is featured in uh, Daughters of the Dust? I'm sure, you know, I've known Julie Dash for a long time. I remember when she was a film student, and so we go way mm -hmm. back. And yeah. I, I know that Julie had that history in mind um, by naming that character, uh, absolutely. Yes. And you know, what happens um. with so many of these historical figures um, they end up getting lost, but during their own lifetimes, they were very well-known people. They were in the public eye. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the reason that we can document them today is because they were in the newspaper, making mm -hmm. a splash, being visible. So, you know, one of the things that we historians do, and especially uh, in a place like the California African American Museum, is not only do we work to um, uh, restore this history, uh, but we also have to ask the question, why 
were these stories buried in the first place? And, oh, absolutely. you know, our, our country is experiencing a level of, of reckoning with the past. And this is, this, is, this is part of what we have to deal with. Um, none of the women that I talked about today, and it's really just a tiny sample, um, almost you know, arbitrary sample, but none of the women that I talked about today were invisible or obscure mm -hmm. figures during their lifetime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for highlighting Biddy Mason. I serve on the ministerial staff at First AME in Los Angeles, and we honor and lift up Biddy Mason all the time. But I had never heard that they were rescued from um, the San Joaquin Mountain area. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Every time we get together, and talk about our past, be it African American history, Asian American history, Native American history, there's more to discover. There's more that comes out. And, and this was a watershed moment for me because as Shanetta, Dr. Shanetta Witherspoon said in the chat, it, um, my spirit is just stirred. I'm really inspired by this presentation. There is so much more that I could say, but I'm going to be quiet and give others an opportunity. I think I saw Jennifer Miyake Trapp with a question uh, that popped up and others. So I'm going to shut down for a moment, if I can, and give room for others. Terrific. Well, I will uh, pose Dr. Mayaki's trap to you, and it is, she leads our um, K through 12 education programs within the Graduate School of Education and Psychology. And so her question pertains to this information that you've given us, how, do, how would you suggest we um, advocate for inclusion of just the tip of the iceberg that you shared with us today, these important women, so that it is in, integrated into the K-12 school curriculum? Yeah, it's a tough question because um, let me let me answer that in a kind of a sideways way, if you don't mind. Uh, when I was a director at the California Historical Society, we worked with the State Department of Education and an outfit that I'm sure you're familiar with called the California um, uh, Council for it's the it's the it's the group that writes the standards and the framework for history and social science C H C H H S or C H S S I always forget but we worked very closely with the group that writes the standards and the framework for history and social sciences and the Department of Education we received a large grant to create an online uh, teaching tool. It's a website called Teaching California. And um, where our interest uh, was because we were co you know, collections people uh, and because we work with historical materials, our interest was to provide teachers and public school students uh, with great appropriate access to primary source materials to learn history and social sciences, which mm -hmm. is a rare thing. Um, primary source materials like you saw in my presentation. And you know, to do my presentation, I, I went to several institutions, the picture of Faye Allen, I got special permission from UCLA Library Special Collections to use that image. And it, I was glad that they gave me permission because I acquired the collection that had that image in it. So I wouldn't have been happy if they told me no. At any rate, we worked with the, that team and created an, a, a website. But I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that part of the problem, as much work has gone into the standards to open them up so that diversity 
is a ruling principle of the standards. Part of the problem is the people that are helping to create and shape these curriculum, um, you know, the principles of the curriculum, they don't know this history. And um, so what we, one of the things that we have to start doing is the schools are separate from the people who know the history. And you can have all the curriculum standards and frameworks that you want, but if you don't have access to the people that actually have the knowledge and they're not all academics, um, then there's gonna be a, you know, that gap. We're gonna keep perpetuating the same ignorance, lack of knowledge, the same exclusion of these histories. Um, I also found that working directly with teachers is really the only way to get materials into the classroom. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but we, we work directly with teachers and we ended up drawing on scholars who may not be conventional academic scholars, but who were the people that carried the knowledge of this history. Thank you. Well, we certainly need to clone you and your colleagues so that we can get more of this information to the sources, to, to the teachers that will continue to share this information. So at this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Weatherspoon. You have a question if you would like to unmute and ask. Okay. Um, hi, uh, Ms. Anderson. Thank you so much for this presentation. As a Los Angeles born native, I went to school in LAUSD my entire K through 12 experience. I have never heard of such. And so I'm kind of like, my eyes are open, of course very um, aware of the current, you know, um, the current people who, you know, lead in education, like the Dr. Kings and the Karen Basses and politics and, you know, but prior to the generation, right, that information is, is, um, is missing and it's very male centered. Um, and I, and I, and I will say uh, white male centered in a lot of ways. And I feel like, um, my question is very similar to the last question, but expanding out broader out of K to 12 and just in general and having um, there be a campaign for awareness of this, because I think this will mobilize a lot of people who need that inspiration or um, that, that the inspiration that holding on to the history brings when you're trying to move things forward. I completely understand what you mean. And, um, you know, it's amazing when you think of like somebody, you know, what I was able to do today was just give tiny little capsules. Um, each one of the women, I could have done the entire presentation on one woman to really give a sense of her, her background, her coming of age, the family culture that she grew out of. Um, you know, all of these women had very complex lives. Um, a lot of them were married and had children um, and had multiple levels of um, engagement and involvement. Um, so, and you think about somebody like, uh, if we just look at Los Angeles, somebody like Betty Hill, there should be a street named after Betty Hill. Um, you know, Betty Hill's helped save Los Angeles from itself. Um, you know, people don't know that in 1926, the Parks Commission segregated the public swimming pools. When you, and just took it upon themselves, you know, to build Jim Crow into the leisure activities of hundreds of thousands of families in the city. And it also was true in the county. And what I didn't mention is that, you know, the day, the day of the week, the Wednesday day or whatever day they let the black 
uh, uh, kids swim in the pool. They drained the pool afterwards. They drained the pool. And yeah. this was Los yeah. Angeles, California in the 20th century. And so a group of women really with Betty Hill leading the charge uh, challenged this. There was a woman, Ethel Priolo. The Priolo family still lives in Los Angeles. In fact, Ethel Priolo was the widow of George Priolo, who was a major in the United States Army. He was a chaplain in the 10th Cavalry. He was a Buffalo soldier and an officer and a gentleman who helped found Bethel AME Church in Los Angeles. So, you know, the, and Ethel agreed with Betty Hill and the group that they had, the Women's Political Study Club, that she would be the plaintiff in the case. She came from this upstanding family, the widow of a, an army officer and a chaplain. And the way the case went on and on and on, it's just, you could, you could make a movie, you know, out of it. But now people use these pools in their neighborhoods and they don't think about it. They have no idea every time someone takes a dive into a public pool in the city of Los Angeles, in the county of Los Angeles and in other areas of California, they're diving into history. And you know, we we are missing something when when we don't know this. I I I agree with you. So we have to find ways, and I'm hoping that we at CAM, uh, I actually have a proposal into our wonderful executive director. Uh, I'm hoping that we at CAM can play a role in helping create structures to connect people with this history throughout the state. If you look around California, unlike other states, um, in the Deep South, in New England, um, that, that do teach people about history where historical societies, you know, play a, a, a larger role. We don't have a lot of that in California. You know, I, I helped run for a while the state, the, the California Historical Society is the official historical society. California, it's a small organization that has no public funding. Um, you know, in Wisconsin, the state, it is the Wisconsin Historical Society is a state historical society. It's 100% funded by the state. If you look, you know, in other states in the, in the South and New England, you're, you're, you have black historical societies. You're, there's more black historical societies in a place like Rhode Island and Connecticut than there are in California. Yeah. So yeah. our sense of our, you know, the importance of history in California has always been challenged. You know, California is a place where people come to forget their history, right? To start yeah. anew, uh, to tear start down anew. the old. But we, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, <laughs> if we want people to begin to uh, have access to this knowledge, um, then we, I think we have to start looking at history differently than we, than we do now. Completely agree. And I really can't fathom that California being such an influence on culture that our own culture is not supported by the state to have a, a historical society, much like other states mm -hmm. here in the U.S. Dean Williams, did you have one more question thought you wanted to share? I see it I on your face, so. please. Yes. <laughs> um, each person represented here, every woman has history. Every woman I contend on our Brady Bunch screen here this morning is one who has been the first in something. First in their family, first in their neighborhood, first in something. And that needs, I, I, am, I, I am convinced that that needs to be told for everyone's history, that needs to be told. I heard you say that the ladies you highlighted today 
uh, had very public lives. You know, they're recorded in the newspaper, the LA Sentinel, um, things of that nature. I, I would ask you to give each and every one of us a couple of tidbits. These might be things we already know, uh, but we just haven't been doing. And if we have, I want you to encourage us to do more. But, but tidbits on how we can get our firsts, even if it's the second or third person, whatever. But how can we get more of our history known, recorded, so that generations from now, we don't lose all of this. Every woman on this screen is a bearer of great stories. Their wounds are full of great story. How do we get them recorded for perpetuity? You know, um, just a few. Minutes. I think that people should start with their own families, whether it's their direct family, their grandparents, or their father's aunt or somebody who's close in their circle. You don't have to travel far to find history that's been made. Most of us, what happens is, you know, the way that the historical um, discipline has been practiced has, has kept people out. And that's changed in a lot of ways, but most people, modestly believe that their lives don't have historical meaning. So the first thing I would do is challenge that and say, mm, look good. at your own family, look at your grandparents, look at your great grandparents, um, connect the younger people in your family to the elders in your family. And at the very least, have a sense of what we do in the archives of preservation. Start to document and record. Um, take really, rec I have heard so many people, I'm sick of it actually. I have no sympathy anymore. I have heard so many people say, I wish, you know, their grandparents died and I wish I had recorded them. I don't want to hear that. Uh, do it now. Um, you know, have a young person do it. it. Record interviews. That's one thing. And the other thing is to hang on to certain kinds of items uh, in your family. You don't have to hang on to every birthday card that somebody sends. But you know when you look at things in your in your circle in your family that there are some things that have meaning, you know, that family Bible or other things that, that are gonna have meaning, historical meaning um, that trace generations back. So that's my, that it would be the first thing I would say was, would be to start with your family. Thank you, thank you. We love those recommendations. And handwritten, I love to, to go back and look at how uh, handwriting of my grandmother and her mother it, it's it is endearing to kind of to see that not only the words mm -hmm. but how it was written so we uh, I do have a question uh, in the chat from Brittany and it is seconded by a couple other people about how we can um, help in teaching our own children since a lot of this is not readily available within what they're being taught at school so um, either now in, or you can provide it to us um, later and I can send that out to the group, but um, they're looking for recommendations of any children's books or resources that we could use to help teach our children the history of these women and, and really to continue their legacy. Well, I think that what I'll do is I'll consult with my colleague, uh, Denise McIver, who's our um, research librarian and our reference librarian at CAM. And I'd be glad to work with her to put together like a little bibliography. One thing I, I feel very 
hopeful when I look at children's literature because that's been an area there 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 are books uh, biographies of historical figures for children who and and these figures have not been written about for adults yet so for instance a dear friend uh, Laura Atkins um, and with some with uh, some collaborators wrote a fine a children's book uh, published by my publisher, Heyday Books, about Biddy Mason. Um, it's called Biddy Mason Speaks Up. And it's the best researched thing I've ever read. I actually, I will admit that I was an advisor on the project, but there's no, <laughs> a, there's no grown up book about Biddy Mason. And she's <laughs> mentioned in a few texts here and, the, here and there, but that whole story there's, but there are children's books, and that's true with other uh, historical figures. So we, we should be able to come up with some, at least a few titles and, and resources. Terrific. Well, I do want to mention that Denise McIver, the librarian at CAM, is here on this call with us. So thank you ahead of time for helping in this. And it is great to see that we are turning the corner, that at least with our next generation that we are being intentional about what what we're teaching them and how we're exposing them. So our last question, just because of the time, I do want to give you a moment to talk about your personal book, The African Americans in the California Dream, if you could maybe elaborate on on what that is about and when we might expect that. Well, um, when we might expect I'm still working on it. <clears throat> And, nope, sure. <laughs> you know, because I, I work and I do public history, it means that I can't write full time. Um, but the book uh, was commissioned by Heyday Books. Um, and it's, I am talking about the, um, the a, a civic history of African Americans in California, starting with the gold rush period through Black Lives Matter. And the reason that I wrap it up there is because a lot of people also don't know. I'm, I'm very California centric in the work that I've done. I feel that California is still, its history is still unknown, still not really reflected in the master narratives. And certainly uh, the history of all these diverse populations is, is, is very little known. Um, people don't realize that the two women, the night that the, who invented the hashtag Black Lives Matter, one was in Los Angeles and the other was in Oakland. And they were texting each other when they created the hashtag. And I'm going to wrap up the story uh, after, you know, showing these uh, generations of, of civic involvement. And the, the, uh, although I talk about community building and community life, and cultural history. Uh, the premise of the book is that um, California is kind of known as an open place, a democratic place, but there's a reason why. And um, the history of the African American population in California helps us understand how uh, the civic life was transformed uh, to become a more uh, uh, egalitarian uh, culture. Terrific. Well, thank you. And I second and third the comments in the chat that we cannot wait for your book to come out. So thank we you. do hope you find more time within your days so that we can <laughs> we can receive that. So, well, ladies, please join me in thanking Miss Anderson for her time and her research and really her heart for preserving and sharing these important women in, in our history and all of our history and that um, our prayer is that this extends beyond what we've seen today and to our next generations, our children, our school and really ingrained in our culture. So thank you, Ms. Anderson. Dean Williams, I'm going to hand it over to you to close us out today. Thank you, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Susan D. Anderson, and thanks to each and every one of you who attended today. Um, I am delighted to say that the pandemic has not 
prevented us from getting together. We so enjoy being together in the mornings at Kathy's home, but we still enjoy being together here online in the comfort of our own homes and, and our own offices, wherever we might be. I think someone was in the car this morning or taking a walk, whatever. It's good to know that the pandemic has not stopped us. I especially thank Vanessa for all the hard work she does pulling these together uh, among, amongst everything else that she does. <laughs> she brings this together in a spirit of excellence. She presents it in a spirit of excellence and um, we get to enjoy the fruit of her labor. Thank you, Vanessa. Ladies, um, shall I announce a benediction? May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May he cause the angel of love and peace and joy and prosperity to rest upon your household. May everything you affix your hands to grow and prosper. This is my prayer for you. From Pepperdine University to you, go in peace and may the peace of God go with you. See you later. Bye-bye.